Hi everybody, I'm Clement. And I'm Maxim. We are the Picard Brothers and you're listening to the House Culture Podcast. House Culture. Hello everybody and welcome to another episode in what is our third season of the House Culture Podcast. Hosted as ever by me, the managing editor at House Culture, Matt Rouse. I hope that you're safe and well wherever you are listening in the world right now. And with restrictions beginning to lift, hopefully you have a packed diary of events to look forward to later on in the year. However, please remember to rave safe. Most of all, look after each other out there, guys. I want to thank you for choosing this podcast today. If you've been here before, you know what's involved. But if it's your first time here, welcome. We are House Culture a collective of house music fans who have come together through their mutual love of the beat to celebrate the spirit of house music. We push the party vibes through daily content delivered via our Instagram feed at housecultureNet, so come follow us there if you don't already. And please make sure you get yourself acquainted with all of the guests that have come before on the podcast. I'm not only talking about originators such as Danny Rampling, Ashley Beadle, Terry Farley and Fatboy Slim, or even important scenesters such as Pike's Hotel creative director Dawn Hindle or saxophone sensation lovely Laura, we've also sat down with leaders from the new school of talent like Sidney Charles, Josh Butler, Alan Fitzpatrick and Medusa. And it's on this tip we continue into the pod right now as we chat to the Grammy award winning Parisian duo Picard Brothers who are absolutely killing it in the scene right now in our chat. You'll hear how their career got supercharged by a speculative message to a dance music megastar. That's one thing that I love with Diplo more than anything is that I literally send beats without an artist or a producer name and you just like the music and you played right away and we got lucky because pretty recently he told us that the mail that he put that day on Twitter, he never checks it and the day he checked it, we were the first mail that he checked. How they have gone on to learn from production masters such as Mark Ronson Mark proposed us to work with him more and more on his album and we learned so many things with him because just watching him do stuff. Not go too much into the production before you actually have the song and when you get the song you can start thinking of where it needs to go. What they are looking for when they are creating their own productions. We were always like trying to find ways to have an accident in our music because uh, it's where like basically the beauty is most of the time. Anything that can bring accident is always welcome. And how their home country has influenced their own output throughout their career so far. We always try to add that extra French house flavor to every production that we made. This one was recorded live and direct from their own studio in Paris. I hope you enjoy it. Here are the Picard Brothers. House Culture. Hi guys, thanks so much for sitting down with us on the House Culture podcast today. As a duo, you are a triple threat of producer, songwriter and DJ. You've worked with the likes of Diplo, Mark Ronson, Beyonce and Madonna and have already won a Grammy Award for your work with Silk City and Dua Lipa. More recently, you've begun an artist project under your family name of Bicar Brothers And this has seen you make a huge impact with singles like Current Banger, Blessing in This House. However, before we come on to all of that, what we always like to do is start at the beginning and find out. Coming from Paris, can you tell us about what kind of music you loved there when you were growing up? So first of all, we we actually was born in the town one hour away from Paris. Okay. It's called... uh, (laughs) Coulomier, mm-hmm. which is close from Paris, to be uh, honest. But the fact that we were born there mm-hmm. was pretty, uh, I guess, uh, important in our music career because we it's a, it's a countryside. So we had the chance growing up to be able to play instruments, be able to play drums, guitars and everything, make as much noise as we want because we l- lived in the countryside. Mm-hmm. And yeah, uh, I feel like we we learn and we started to enjoy music by playing it and we always played together as like a band we were making covers of i don't know rock songs rage against the machine or like uh, arctic monkeys which uh, was a really important group for us Mm -hmm. and yeah from there we we started to collect uh, a lot of 
gears in like a spare room that we had in the house and we started to make some more electronic music this all happened during like the late 90s early 2000s where the french house era was mm -hmm. really the biggest thing yeah. and yeah that's how we like we we pretty much grew up in this weird mix of house music from friends and which was at the time the biggest pop songs mm -hmm. basically we didn't even realize yeah. it was house music by them mm -hmm. and and playing rock songs as well and was there you know growing up kind of in the countryside like you mentioned was there a scene in terms of you going out and experiencing live music anywhere were you going clubbing or going to gigs or was it all via the radio and tv that you're experiencing music at that time i think it was the experience we had with the music was more about radio because there were like probably two clubs but pretty far away yeah. from where we live mm -hmm. it was like not really like super cool clubs to be honest <laughs> so yeah it was mostly about like the radio and as mike said at that time the biggest house tracks were like playing on radio and everybody even like the parents and everything yeah. were like listening to this music mm -hmm. yeah it was like actual pop music mm -hmm. but yeah it was like more of an experimentation that we made in the second floor of our parents house <laughs> which is basically since 15 probably 20 years now the same mess we, yeah, we made all, all the instruments and because <laughs> so our parents are like super happy we're making music but still there's like tons of gears and guitars yeah. and we pretty need, much everything everywhere mm -hmm. we need to clean that sometimes <laughs> but i feel yeah radio yeah, was and a cool playground and also um video clips late at night where like they were playing the weird stuff mm -hmm. and i think we learned a lot of like i remember that's something that i kind of miss these days like you know when like you were watching like two hours of video clips and you didn't know what you're gonna see next and mtv and like we had a tv sh a tv a channel in france called mcm as well mm -hmm. they were playing the weirdest electronic music and that's how we like got into it basically yeah. mm -hmm. and you've already mentioned things like arctic monkeys being very important to um your influences you know obviously that's completely at odds with kind of where you are now almost it's interesting to hear that that's been an influence on you and the late 90s kind of french house you know stardust daft punk all those types of sounds um you know with what other kind of inspirations did you have when you were making this music initially oh i feel like that's a common from every producer like when you kind of start making music you almost like always make start by making rap beats mm -hmm. or like making like a yeah like a sample rap beats or something like so we we pretty much started making rap beats for different rappers in France, which was pretty confidential. And yeah, I didn't mention that, but we were listening to a lot of a lot of uh, French rap music at the time as well, and and super interesting because we realized like later that like the music that we liked the most was actually in fact produced by Cassius like this I don't know if you know MC mm -hmm. Solar mm -hmm. which is like a, like a big icon from the 90s French scene and we didn't know back then that it was produced by the Cassius we even barely know who were the Cassius back then mm -hmm. and yeah it's interesting to see that all those things that we liked were some are connected and yeah 20 no maybe 10 years later 15 years later it's still something that we like as much as back then <laughs> yeah no Cassius obviously much missed um yeah I didn't even know that either about that connection between Solar and, and Cassius it's quite interesting <laughs> that you say that it's mind-blowing that's nuts they didn't produce everything but they executive produced the the record uh -huh. like um, Philippe Zah was uh, engineering the record mm -hmm. and Boombas was making some of the instrumentals with the other producer on the project so yeah, yeah. yeah there was a pretty they had a pretty important part in making this record and that's for sure mm -hmm. so you know you've been making a lot of noise in the countryside in france you you've, you've got to grips with a certain number of instruments you know you're you're messing around you know and you've been in bands or whatever was there a point where you thought I want to make a career in music or was it ever just let's see where this goes and what happens yeah i think at, at first it was like this it was definitely let's have fun let's making music with these like 
loop it over that we get out and start doing stuff, just making music, like mm. just to play around. And then we discovered like footy loops and then we start like geeking a little bit in this like new thing for us. Mm -hmm. And as Max said, we kind of started by making rap beats and working with like super unknown guys from the area. And then I'm uh, not saying that disrespectfully, it was just super <laughs> confidential. Uh -huh. And then we kind of like meet other people and other people. And yeah, it was like just af after a few years, we started to think like, we really want to do it now. Is it possible for us? At least let's try. And so we keep, we've been keeping on doing this. And I guess we met the right person mm -hmm. at the certain moment of our yeah. life. Yeah. I was about to say, we definitely considered um, making a life out of it when we got in touch with Diplo. But mm -hmm. before that, there was like maybe three or four years of just having fun, like just making music together and no other ideas, no other thoughts than just like having fun. Yeah. So talk to me about the Diplo connection. I have read how it's kind of happened, but I want to hear the story from you guys. Is it just, you know, was it as simple as responding to a tweet? Take take us through what happened. Yeah, it's, it's super, it's super still uh, mind-blowing for us till this day because we basically got in touch with, with him uh, one day because he, he put on his, as a tweet on his Twitter page, um, his email address asking for DJs to send tracks for, for his actual DJ sets. And we were already fans of his production. Back then, he already had um, Paper Planes. And I think it was just right after Upon the Floor and the first mm -hmm. Major Laser album. So very, like, we always felt like this album was a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And so he put his address on Twitter. And back then, we were making just... We didn't have an artist guy at all. We were just making beats. And it's funny because we sent two or three beats that day and he replied right away. I remember that one of them had a Tiesto sample, <laughs> which was really, uh, pretty cool. It was a trap beat with a Tiesto sample, mm -hmm. which was like crazy, <laughs> crazy <laughs> idea back then. And he replied right away and we got lucky because he, he was playing in Paris the week after. So we literally, after I sent that mail, we saw him like five days later or something like that. Wow. And we went to have dinner with him. And and following that, uh, pretty quickly after that, I guess Luda Chris um, rapped on one of our beats that never came out in the end. But this actually um, sped everything up because it was right around the time where um, Diplo was... a. Uh, getting more involved in producing for other artists. Mm -hmm. And he didn't mind having people maybe aim helping him on the songwriting side or like just basically helping him why when he's not when he's away DJing in the world wherever he was. And yeah, that was that was that's still super mind blowing because like pretty recently he told us that the mail that he put on, on that he put that day on Twitter. Mm -hmm. He never checks it and the day he, cho he checked it we were the first mail and he checked so <laughs> wow yeah <laughs> it was a big step up uh, yeah. this time. that's crazy and you know have you still got those beats that you sent him have you listened to them recently what are your thoughts on them now i, I checked <laughs> them one of them is pretty good to, yeah. like i'm not bragging but one of them is still pretty current sounding like i was uh but that's one thing that I love with Diplo more than anything is that you have to picture that he was already a massive big star mm -hmm. and we didn't have a name back then. Like I literally sent beats without a, an artist or a producer name and he just liked the music and, and he replied to it. Like mm -hmm. it's just like there's few people that mm -hmm. just only listen to music and he's definitely one of them yeah yeah and so you're you know you're face to face with someone obviously that you're already a fan of because you know you've been sending him some beats already you know did you feel like that this was a a real turning point or were you still kind of fans at this point oh that was awful <laughs> like we like we were too way too stressed way too bad in english it was nice though. Yeah. It's not his fault, but we were way too stressed to make that moment a pleasant moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that didn't that he didn't care. Like, yeah. I think he understood the situation and 
as I told you, the, the that, that ludicrous song literally like forced everything to happen, basically. And yeah, back then I was a sound engineer. Clem uh, had, a, had another work as yeah. well. And we kept doing that and sending like 20 beats a week for to Diplo. And eventually we like started to get into that zone where we were going to LA, making songs with him staying for a month and like going back and forth in between Los Angeles and Paris. And since then, we basically never stopped doing that. Wow. Wow. And yeah, I suppose just that kind of just naturally evolving suddenly when you look to where you were in the middle of that and look to where you started, it's suddenly like, wow, we've come such a long way, but it's so natural to get there, I suppose. Yeah, it was it was a crazy period because like we were literally going to... LA and like Clem was working in like the medical uh, yeah I was like a physical therapist at the time (laughs) and he was working with uh, like he was literally like from a day to another like uh, taking care of people that was burned like third degree burn (laughs) then two weeks later we were in the studio with like whatever Snoop Dogg or like it was just like insane for us first time in LA seeing all the people Wow, what a first way to experience LA as well. <laughs> Sometimes to 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 achieve some like having big cuts with big names and all these Grammy situation and stuff. That's like crazy for us still, but it took some years to get there. So it was not like too fast to oh, yeah. uh, to ride away, like going from this small town in France where we were playing rock in, <laughs> in our garage basically to Grammy Awards and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I guess it was like it was okay. We we managed to to look at this pretty peacefully and like to yeah. to enjoy that. Yeah, yeah, like you know, step by step along the way. Exactly. Yeah, and you know, obviously after you know you've worked with Diplo, and I'm thinking as well, you've worked with other major artists, including like Mark Ronson. You know, you co-wrote a lot of his last album. Someone like him, take us through that kind of first meeting and how that happened as well. Obviously, you know, there are levels of talent and he's really up there in terms of a producer as well as an artist. You know, how did that feel for you guys getting in the studio with him and what did you learn and and how did all that happen? Uh, First of all, we were obviously big fans of him, like big fans of him since like years and years. So... The day we knew we were going to the studio to meet him and to work with him, at the time he was to work on the 60 project. So that was like him and Diplo. And it was a big day for us. And we were like, okay, let's get ready to, yeah. <laughs> to do something good today. Yeah, like, we need to, to nail it. <laughs> and it was super important for us, obviously. Mm-hmm. And to be, to be honest, he was like super cool with us. Uh, the vibe was really, really cool. So it wasn't like difficult at all. Plus we got the chance, we got lucky enough to, I guess this day being like yeah, good right. enough that so, it yeah. didn't throw us away <laughs> from the studio. Yeah, there's good days and bad days. And luckily that was, that was a that good was day. That was a good one. So <laughs> after this first day, it was like, we still got the pressure because we wanted to do our best and mm. do good music with him. But the first day it was like, okay, now we got this we started working on some cool stuff everybody seems to be happy we are super happy yeah so let's keep going and and then we managed to he mark proposed us to to work with him more and more on his album which was like a super great period of time for Mm -hmm. us because we were like super focusing on this and we learned some so many things with him because as you said he's like one of the masters in terms of production Mm -hmm. yeah and yeah we learned a lot of just watching him do stuff Uh, watching him doing that particular album like taught us a lot because like i guess we are from an era of producer making like we 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 starting doing it in that scene where like everybody only working with the macbook Mm -hmm. which is totally fine but we never had the chance to experience actually somebody working the studio and seeing that definitely uh, gave us so many more tools that we didn't have before. Yeah. 
and yeah we we spent a whole year following him like from LA to London Las Vegas New York it was it was surreal basically it was very surreal and and yeah to this day we're really happy to and grateful for for Diplo to have put us in the room with Mark and Mark to let us uh, do a, a small part uh, of his album. <laughs> I mean, you know, that obviously went on to great success as well. And, you know, I mentioned at the top of this that you had great success with Silk City and Dua Lipa and Electricity, you know, and that's won a Grammy Award. You know, what was that like were you actually there for for that and you know did you expect to win you know when the, was the competition stiff uh, the grammy situation was a little bit tricky for us because there were so many people on the not so many but there was a few there was a few people that additional produced the record mm-hmm. there was a, such we couldn't get into the ceremony basically because there was a mistake that was made but we are past that now. And back then we like didn't very really, really realize that we might won. So we didn't really care because like we were against um disclosure, which are like yeah. legends for us. Yeah. And especially that track we thought back then it was the biggest dance track in the world Mm -hmm. not like the biggest in the world but like the best in the selection and we felt very lucky that we ended up winning we Mm -hmm. actually got the actual grammy so (laughs) that's all that counts right (laughs) that's all that counts and also that day we were we we were actually in la so it felt like we were there because we went to the grammy parties afterwards and everything we just didn't go to the ceremony basically (laughs) but uh yeah that we 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 got the chance to celebrate it uh, at least <laughs> yeah and um, you know you mean you mentioned about um going back to mark as well seeing him in the studio and operate like you know a desk and a real studio type vibe rather than just something on a laptop what's your production process like now you're obviously in your studio right now do you prefer to have it old school and all the faders and everything physically in front of you or do you want to be doing it all the time on the run you know on the move and working from a laptop uh we we're trying to as much as possible uh not depend on any type of gear Mm -hmm. because we travel uh, before covid we traveled so much that we needed to be able to produce a, a record like basically with just a macbook and some iphone earplugs or like nothing like too fancy like i feel like sometimes having a, a nice studio can be a little bit tricky if you need stuff to, if you feel like you need stuff to make music it can be a little bit um, hard and like it doesn't help your creativity mm-hmm. but i would say since we like we moved into this studio pretty recently and it's been a couple of months that we mostly start all of our song with just the piano just try to lay down the the songwriting of the song Mm -hmm. and then we see where we can take it with the production and that's for sure something that we learned with mark Mm -hmm. not go too much into the production before you actually have the song and when you get the song you can start thinking of where it needs to go and yeah it's felt like it feels like the healthiest way for us to make songs and not fight when we are trying to produce him you know Mm -hmm. yeah it's really that's a really interesting point you know case in point being blessing in this house it's a it's an absolutely like gospel house beauty it's got like organs it's got you know great vocals on it it's got a real like chug to it I, you know i love it um and comparing yeah. that to other output that you've done which we've already talked about kind of like french touch house style things as well in particular tell us about how you got to blessing in this house was that i assume no it's, it didn't always start out as like okay let's make a gospel yeah. house style track you know how did that kind of come about actually uh one day so it was like probably two years ago now because it's like a song we made like a long time now mm-hmm. ago and max sent me uh this vocal uh, telling me you should check this it's crazy our voice is incredible and so we so i i heard it and i was like wow we, we need to to make something out of it let's try to to use it if mm-hmm. this singer is cool with that and let's make our own song out of it yeah and try to make a house gospel beat like super like 
energy can like super like continuous i guess yeah it like, was like pretty pretty fast in terms of the way we've been making it it was like pretty instant and that's actually one of the first song first demo that we made uh, before signing on the label it was not even at the time like no. uh, plan like we didn't we, we didn't sign at this moment so it was like just let's do a song for us yeah let's have fun with that that yeah. that record yeah we 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 found that record just like scrolling we we are big fans of um vocals that are like as this tone like we're a big fan of gospel vocals mm -hmm. and we're always on the hunt for it and we want i want to spend like two or three hours on spotify and youtube trying to find like that one golden song that never been used before mm -hmm. and this, uh, this amazing i found this amazing singer called carrie kirisma events mm -hmm. which is still like here with us now and uh i quickly try to reach her and ask her like can we can we try to flip that song it's amazing i'm sure like can do something dope with it mm -hmm. and yeah i started to chop it up and clem made that amazing bass line that you can hear on the drop mm -hmm. and it was pretty like quick and yeah that's basically as clem said the uh, the track that got us into our label like when we played that they were like okay let's do it let's we want to work with you guys and and yeah the that was two years ago but now we're happy it's out and it's doing how it's doing yeah i mean the release of it like you say if it was two years ago has that been consciously kept back because we've spoken to a lot of other people on the podcast that have still been releasing regular material during lockdown obviously clubs are closed no one's out dancing but i've still felt the need to get creative and just push stuff out there just to get it done um has there been a a point where you've thought i really want to hold on to this for as long as i can and then release it when people are going to be dancing or is it like okay no this, this just needs to get out because i'm moving on i feel like we always thought that this record was like probably one of the most timeless that we got. So it was like not a problem for us to to keep it for a certain amount of time. And then we felt like it was the right timing now because as you said, everybody's super happy to go back to see concerts and go to clubs and, yeah. and be dancing again. We don't want to release like only slow songs because nobody can dance. Yeah. So it was like, yeah, I think the right timing for us to to make people hear our song because we are like super happy about it and it's been like a long time now that we got this song yeah and i mean we still love it so i hope people <laughs> love it too <laughs> yeah no it's been all over our instagram page to be honest and we've had so much like response to it we did a video with it over a kanye west like him playing the organ and it looked like he was playing it yeah. it looked so good <laughs> yeah and the uh, you know the the synthy remix as well is is incredible i mean how do you go about choosing collaborators and remixes and uh, and people that are going to work on your own work do you do you think oh this this is going to be perfect for this person or is it just a case of actually who's available who can do it oh we, we treat them as christmas gifts basically like <laughs> first is we asked todd edwards which is like one of our ultimate legends mm -hmm. Um, for this song, uh, Won't Let Go, that was the actual first ever release that we put out mm -hmm. since we signed to Island Records. And Cinti, we just been so amazed by her for so many years. She's like doing so many stuff. She's always super on point. Mm -hmm. we, be, we didn't know her before asking her to remix it, but since then we... We're talking and she's the nicest too <laughs> and she really like uh, we had this you know the, the original song is pretty much a gospel house song but we like she added another layer of fun to it and like everybody seems to enjoy it so yeah thank you thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know i can't i can't wait to hear it like in its proper environment you know in a proper club like vibrating through me i mean how much are you guys missing that at the moment oh so much <laughs> starting to be like super yeah. long now there yeah. are so many songs that we want to try basically like <laughs> we're missing that just the fact of trying songs and see 
what's not working in the mix and stuff like this, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, is that how you work? Because we spoke to Anya Schneider and Alan Fitzpatrick and, and they were very much like, it's difficult for them to make a judgment on how good this track is when it's just, you know, they're at home or just in the studio with one other person. Is that how you guys work as well? You need to be playing it to an audience and constantly tweaking it to make sure it gets right. Yeah, I feel like that's one of the final moves, yeah. the, the best move that you get. It's the ultimate test. Yeah, it's the ultimate test. <laughs> we we do know. have like... Uh, we do have a bunch of like the workaround that we found is just sending us sending the track to our dj friends and like we have a really close dj friends so they are like no you need to do this this won't work blah 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 and mm -hmm. like we collect all the notes and we're pretty sure that it might work yeah. if it ever goes into a club but yeah i mean you can still like try to mix it at home just putting your song in the middle of yeah. other ones that are really dope and just <laughs> see if it sounds like shit or if it's good enough yeah but, but still it's just but you in your room so that's mm. still like uh <laughs> very uh, sad like if you do it in two in between like i don't know like uh you don't know me and another like amazing song it will never sound good so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you need to be nice with it you, <laughs> you like. need to put it in two songs yeah. that okay so not too much not, pressure yeah. you know <laughs> yeah yeah you need to you need to find the perfect moment to drop it i mean is that nerve-wracking when you're actually in that environment and you know you've got something that you think is really really good and you're really happy with and that first time you present it to an audience have you ever had those moments where it's not gone the way you hoped it would or is it always like okay i know how i'm going to improve this uh, we we did see once diplo played lean on uh, major laser mm -hmm. linen mm -hmm. in, in Las Vegas before it got released and it literally emptied the floor <laughs> like every like everybody left so since then yeah. like I, I enjoy doing it but I feel like it doesn't really matter it doesn't yeah. really means a lot you know mm -hmm. and like it was really like two months later it was the biggest song in the world so yeah yeah who knows yeah, you need more than one yeah. one test one yeah <laughs> Yeah, I remember we interviewed David Morales and he was saying about, you know, sometimes he'd play like a 12 or 13 hour set at his club and he'd be like, sometimes I'll have a tune that no one's heard before and I'll play it once and it'll clear the floor. He was like, then I'll play it again two hours later and then I'll play it a third time and a fourth time. And he was like, by that fifth time or whatever, people get it and get that what he's trying to present with it and whatever. And it just takes those. That means a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's smart. <laughs> you know the saying, like, if you listen to a song seven times, you like it. It's like a given, like, you have to like it if you listen to a song seven times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, you're obviously a duo um, who work closely together. Do, you, do each of you have a specialism or do you free form and free flow? How do you work your ideas between yourselves? I feel like we kind of, uh, uh, it's like a free process, mm -hmm. but in the end, Maxim is like really good at mixing and engineering everything. And even like the way we produce songs uh, comes a lot from, from him. But we, there's no really pro, yeah. a pro, a one process, but we can like start stuff separately uh, and just see what's come out of all this. Yeah. Or we rather like uh, being in the studio and start doing something together. That's yeah. the best for us. But mm -hmm. sometimes we can't, so we just do the other yeah. way. Yeah, it really but, depends, to be honest, because there was times where like, um, for instance, for remixes, we found it... Um, even more interesting when yeah. like how like Clem would start an idea on on, a, on his own. I would start an idea on my own, and then we just pick the best ideas and we try to make a, a, a remix out of it. Mm -hmm. And for remixes, yeah, and sometimes we mix the like really yeah. the res the final result is like a proper mix of, of yeah. two or three ideas. You know, it brings it's like fun. we we're always like trying to find ways to have a accident in our music mm -hmm. because um, it's uh, where like uh, basically the beauty is most of the time, and anything that can bring accident is always welcome. And this is one of the ways that we found to like you know there's like stuff that your brain wouldn't connect, but if you're like trying like 
stuff like this like mm. you would make ideas that you would have never thought before so yeah there's not like a proper way we like to work just depends on the song basically uh, mm. for for our art stuff we for our album we are like um, it's a it's a mix of uh, house music and more like a song songs mm -hmm. and there's music that there's stuff that we started with the piano build the old song out of it and then just sample like two seconds of it so you know just like we just let yeah. the song like uh, we we try to serve the song more than just uh, yeah. make a i don't know like uh, trying to reach a, a, a how do you say that check boxes like, like yeah like, like a formula yeah. exactly yeah and it's funny because sometimes and it happened with our next release uh we are like stuck on something and we try again and again and again and usually we don't do that because at some point we said okay this is just not working so let's go on something else mm -hmm. but we were like coming back over and over over on a, a vocal that we got that we really loved and finally after like 10 version of the of the song it really worked so we we're like super happy and kind of surprised that finally yeah the song worked mm -hmm. but yeah it's another way of making music that we never really experienced to do that to do yeah. that yeah like yeah. 10 times in a row <laughs> there are sometimes yeah sometimes it's really easy and sometimes you, it's just you know that you have to go into another song but there's stuff that needs to be used somehow later and we try to remember those beats and go back to that uh, library in our mind to like and that happened with that song that we're going to release next which is called best of me mm -hmm. we got this amazing um, vocal from stasi i guess that's how he say his name it's a Aus australian producer and singer mm -hmm. and yeah we 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 were making that song and we had the chorus in our mind and we just brought it and it was like a, like it was made for it basically <laughs> Yeah, um, cool. I mean, you mentioned an album there as well. I mean, are you guys working on, you know, albums in dance music, they can sometimes feel like collections of singles and things like that. Are you, When you're talking about an album, are you looking to create something that is a, is a whole, you know, it has a real theme to it and uh, really tells a story and has a message or is it just something like, just something to put all our, our tracks together on? Um, we are making it right now and it's moving every month, but we, we are already collecting a, a lot of songs. Uh, so far, what I can tell you is that it's definitely not a collection of club songs, but mm -hmm. more like an album with like different BPMs, different vibes mm -hmm. and much more like, um, much more like, uh, what you would hear on like a Bronson album or even like, mm -hmm. a, Daft Punk album mm -hmm. where like songs vary mm -hmm. in terms of BPM and everything yeah. and uh, and yeah we're trying to push the it's like a recreation for us basically we're trying to have the most fun possible we made like a, an amazing um, gospel house song with the actual choir that's in that's pretty uh, cool we track some um, strings we track some horns we're trying to like make the album uh, that we always dre dreamt to make. Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, it sounds spine tingling already. Yeah, I guess. And it comes from what we've done these past years too, the way we've been making songs too. So it's, yeah, it's a crossover between house tracks and club songs and... Maybe more Something. pop stuff, maybe. Mm. Yeah, it's yeah. more like, yeah, it's a, it, there's some real songs on it yeah. as well. Where like you can sing them at the karaoke if you want. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, you know, how do you know, you're obviously brothers and your family, you know, how do you approach kind of disagreements between each other? Um, is it more intense because you're related or, you know, um, is it easier to sort out or is there a lot of punching door slamming throwing things oh, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes we, we we kind of disagree on stuff but we, we i mean it's easy to just talk to each other and it just 
tell each other, well, I think we should do that. Oh, yeah. I like this. Oh, I don't like that. Oh, mm -hmm. we, we always find like the place where we're both happy and yeah. and we're enjoying the music we're making. So there's no like big issues at all. So yeah, it's, I would say I, it's easier even. Yeah, I would say it's easier like to really serve the music when like you like if it wasn't my brother or like I could I couldn't say yeah no like I would have to find workarounds to tell him that I don't like that bass sound or something. <laughs> this never but, happens, by the way. Yeah, he never <laughs> find bad uh, bass sound. But in in the world where like he would <laughs> yeah he would choose a bad bass in a sound. Sci-fi movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like. At the worst case, the scenario is just us going back in our laptops, trying two ideas, and then like music tells you which one is the best one. So it tells, <laughs> like it's the third judge if the music is like you can tell if the music is better or not. You know. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. You you're just happy to say yes, no, not worry about any yeah. types of feelings. I suppose. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Especially we can like change our mind like from one week to another. So Finally, I think you were right about that, and I think we should do that that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you can still do that with a friend, but yeah. I guess it's easier with your brother because you and you're never gonna say like stupid shit to your brother. Oh, yeah. Where, whereas maybe you can like just like have a bad ag argument with your friend, and maybe you just stop doing music with him. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it's gonna be my brother forever, so <laughs> we have to get along. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you have to look, and uh, you know, it's not it's you're not worried about bruising egos or anything like that because you completely understand each other i suppose working with people in a studio environment you've got to quickly suss out you know how to give them those constructive criticisms and whatever and uh, really yeah. massage some egos here and there yeah yeah that's something that we have a, like a hard way to balance whenever we go to la for like a songwriting sessions because uh, the way we talk to each other doesn't really let room for common ground you know mm -hmm. it's like either that id or that id but we are not trying to please both of them mm -hmm. and sometimes we're in sessions you know you have to kind of go like uh, i'm missing the actual uh, expression but you have to have a step towards the other guy who you're working with and they meet in yeah. the middle exactly <laughs> and that doesn't make sense for me when it comes to making music because <laughs> like it's either we go your way or my way but like we're not gonna like be sure it's gonna be bad you know mm. like <laughs> finding a middle one it's always like trying like it's like always you're you're sure that it's not the best idea well you just try to please the egos but it's not serving the music you know in the end yeah, and to be a good producer, I'd imagine you'd, you'd have to have that no compromise attitude. You have to be like, I know what's going to sound good. This is what it should be and not be afraid to say that. Yeah, I mean, it's not as a... Uh, I'm not sure I'm right, but I'd rather go full your way mm -hmm. than just dim down my ID to, you know, like... There's no place for, I guess putting water in your wine when it comes to making music, you know? <laughs> sorry. This expression? It's really like a translation of a French expression, sorry. I oh, know, it's, it's great. I was going to say, it sounds like a very French expression, to be honest. So it's, it's, it's a very good one. Um, I mean, so when you're collaborating with people, you know, are there, is there anyone out there that you're looking at that you haven't worked with that you really want to work with? Or is it a case of... You know just see what happens and we're just having fun and you know the, the the kind of talent machine rolls on is there any particular people that you're looking at to target and think their voice would be perfect for us or something that we're thinking about oh voice uh yeah i mean there's uh there's a lot of voices that we love we got lucky last year two years ago to make a, a song with beyonce for our album on uh, the lion king mm -hmm. and since this day we waiting for the day she she sings on the house track <laughs> probably it's not gonna be our track but i still want <laughs> to hear that and yeah there's we we're more attached to uh, amazing voices you know like uh, i would say maybe shaka khan is like the ultimate one or or jocelyn brown yeah. or or people like this i would yeah. die to make a track with them mm -hmm. And yeah, there's also so many producers that we are obviously the Daft Punk, but 
like a, a dream, you know, and like uh, there's a new producer in, in the LA scene who produced uh, for Silk Sonic. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like an actual songwriter producer called D-Mile. He's amazing. And, like we're really impressed by everything that he produced. Mm-hmm. But that's on the producer producing side, you know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we, we it's, it's more about the voice, you know, like uh, it's not so much about the... We, we felt so many times that we were making, uh, when we were producing for other people, that it happens that the demo with the actual songwriter sounds better than the actual song that gets released because the artist took the song and sang it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that is the most frustrating song for us because, once again, it doesn't serve the music at all. You know, like you, you, you know that the best possible outcome for that song is not the one that went yeah. out. And that's something that we... Yeah, that's why in our music, we just decided to find and keep the best vocal uh, that we get, even if it's not a big name or yeah. it's not that count for us. It's really like, what is the best song? What is like making us feel like, wow, this is incredible. And mm-hmm. so obviously we, someday I hope we'll, we'll be working on our music with like big names and if it dope songs. <laughs> But for now, it's a matter of like just being like super 100% happy with the songs yeah, exactly. and making exactly the music that we want. And it's also a way to, to do music faster because it's yeah. hard to, especially with, we've been, I mean, you know, what we've been all through. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we were stuck in Paris. We actually like did some cool demos and stuff in Paris because there's like a cool scene of great songwriters. Yeah. So we're working mostly in Paris right now, which was like something that we barely did before. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we did, didn't have access to uh, like the songwriting scene in the in the US for four years. So yeah. Yeah, we had to, to to keep making music yeah. and keep making songs. And yeah, we came to a point where I felt that I was too stupid to not work with our friends here and maybe uh, just try to develop that more in Paris, which is like non-existent, basically. There's not like a songwriting scene like in the UK or like in the US. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Everybody's working on their project, but like with the years, we ended up being friends with most of them. So we like, uh, yeah, it's it's another energy and like uh, we we like it a lot these days yeah i mean that's really cool and that's one of the positive things i suppose that's come out of this situation people looking more like locally about their environment and what they can do in and around where they are rather than having to always think about worldwide aspects and i've got to travel here and i've got to do this is you know sometimes being a bit more closer to home can be you know you discover more more new and interesting things it's great especially because we we've been working with like different artists mostly artists actually and well it's always better not to finish a song and say okay so who could actually sing this song yeah uh because if you're working with like great artists they have a vision of what what's going on and that's some really talented people that we've been working with so it was like already like songs like that are actually done and and we can produce it with them and yeah it's it's a great process for us to do that in Paris. Yeah, they always days. like we found that working here it's make makes it easier because people that we're gonna work with are gonna treat the song like that's their own as well you know and they put the same level of um that word i'm missing yeah. that all the time <laughs> uh they want it to be perfect you know yeah like want it to as if it was their project so mm-hmm. There's not like a space for, oh, they're going to fix it whenever the artist takes the song, you know. Mm-hmm. So we're obviously in the middle of 2021 right now, and it looks like um, clubs, you know, it can still be, a, there will still be some kind of restrictions around them for the next few months at, at the very least. Um, wh- how far have you guys got planned in advance of this time of year? Is, is it just everything's up in the air or are you hoping to be out there playing live and releasing new music towards the end of the year what's what's your kind of diary looking like we're hoping to to start to dj again so we're hoping to start doing it and like we're gonna do a hopefully a, a release a big release party for our next single best of me mm-hmm. honestly paris feels like pretty 
like it feels like everything yeah. is reopening right now mm-hmm. uh we are planning as if everything is going to stay open so we're gonna have uh, one or two songs during the summer uh, a bunch of remixes a video and everything mm-hmm. and we're hoping to release our album in the beginning of next year and yeah in between that we 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 can't wait to go back to the us to travel again make music maybe dj there we were we were planning way like just when lockdown happened we were planning to go to ibiza to stay like maybe for three three four more weeks to actually work on music and maybe play there so mm-hmm. We'll see how it goes this summer, but we still have that in the back of our mind. And mm-hmm. yeah, that would be that would be amazing. Yeah, hopefully we'll all get to Ibiza at some point this year. <laughs> yeah, fingers <laughs> crossed. Okay, so yeah, let's move on to... Um, it's called the House Culture Perfect Playlist. It's on Spotify. And what we've done is every single one of our guests has chosen five tracks based on different themes for the playlist i think it's so you know we've interviewed so many people and it's so big now it's almost 24 hours long i think this playlist so you know it's great that you guys have submitted some tracks and more importantly you've submitted tracks that no one's chosen before so it's always really yeah i i'm super surprised yes these tracks have to be in this playlist before before us not yet that's that's even better yeah it's you know i think the most popular one obviously we've had is like faithless insomnia i think like that's come up about four or five Uh, times but so all i really need is um just like just a little story or your experience with this track and why you've chosen it why it's important to you so we always start with a catalyst track a track that originally got you into dance music or a love for house music, um, what have you chosen for that and why? Uh, so I guess we chose uh, Daft Punk from Daft Punk. And as I told you before, like this one, especially like I remember exactly the moment where we were watching video clips and that video came and you don't understand anything that happens, <laughs> but it's the most fascinating thing you, you ever seen. Mm-hmm. And it's everything combined. Like you love it, you are fascinating by it. You have no idea what it is, and and now it's over. You're gonna mm. have to listen to that all your life. <laughs> and somehow later, you understand that it was house music. You know? Yeah, and, exactly. And that feeling is perfect for me. Like yeah. the fact that you don't have to understand the music to listen to enjoy it. Mm. It's the it's like the main goal of making music to me. Yes, yeah, super spontaneous. So if you hear it, nobody, if you hear it, you're going to sing it all day. I mean, it's going to stay in your mind forever because it's the perfect loop. And it's like, it's the perfect thing. It's like super like spontaneous, like, uh, I don't know if you said that, but immediate. Like, yeah, like, like right like away. Right in your face yeah, yeah. in a good way. Mm-hmm. And, and the structure is so free too like it's like every eight bars there's a new element and then mm-hmm. it switch completely with the tb303 at the end it's like yeah, yeah you guys won it's the perfect yeah. song <laughs> plus plus i feel at this time radio in france were playing this type of music yeah. for some yeah. reason like <laughs> um i mean on regular or like mm-hmm. yeah big radio big radios mm-hmm. like not like house mm-hmm. oriented radios and like our parents or everybody in it knew that song yeah I, like you say it's interesting you call out the video as well that video just i remember seeing that on mtv and just being like what is this and then just the music and even now like it's one of the only tracks that I, like so many people could just id just from the just the beat yeah. just yeah. that just that iconic amazing so <laughs> Let's go on to a floor filler, um, a track that, you know, you'll just whack on and you'll always have to run to the dance floor. What have you chosen here? This is probably another surprising one that's not in here already, but I'm so pleased that it now is. So tell us what it is. Uh, I guess we chose uh, Armin van der Den uh, featuring Drain Arden, You Don't Know Me. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I was super happy when like, I don't know if you see that clip from that illegal rave that you guys had in the UK like this week. <laughs> mm-hmm. And like, the DJ played that one and everybody went nuts. Yeah, yeah. It's the perfect track. It's the perfect track because it blends everything that everybody likes. It blends like that hip hop feel and 
the great like Dwayne Arden is a master, mm. like he's one of our favorite vocalists, mm. and the vocals are perfect. It's so free and liberating, and it also has this super cool filter sample. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, yeah it's like we, we love Armand Van Elden music too. It's yeah. like super like that's what we try to put in our music too, some kind of sample feel. Even if there's no sample, we always try to have this type of texture in our music. And mm -hmm. I guess it comes a lot from this yeah. type of musicians. Mm -hmm. And a, a sunsetter. So we kind of talked about Ibiza. This is always a track that you can think of that would just soundtrack that perfect sunset for you. What what have you chosen there? We chose, yeah, Alan. Okay, so basically Alan Braggs had a side project with uh, Romuald, which mm -hmm. is like a Parisian like singer who actually worked later on with Justice on a lot of songs. Um, so they had this side project called The Paradise and the track is called In Love With You. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I guess it's around 110 BPM-ish, something like that. And it's, it's amazing. It's a beautiful track and it grows. There's like a, like a choir at the beginning mm -hmm. and it grows, it grows. It feels like, a, feels like the perfect track to play uh, on a beach somewhere super late when like... Uh, the sun is uh, mm -hmm. setting or rising it doesn't even matter <laughs> the, the I time. Think it works both times <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was both yeah brilliant brilliant um and a, a tearjerker as well what's the tearjerker for you oh. uh yeah we put robin dancing on my own mm -hmm. cuz i think this track is literally not as uh, not underrated but like it should be credited more because it's the beginning of a, a pop era from that song. Mm -hmm. And it's also like sending the, um, the marks of this, I don't know, like, there's like a melancholy to it, but it's still feels super euphoric. Yeah. And I never listened to it without listening it to the end. And, and yeah, I feel like uh, Robin is the master. Like she, she literally gave birth to that song that has been been reproduced so many times right after that, both in the house scene and both in the pop scene. And yeah, that's like the most euphoric song and saddest song ever. Yeah. And like, you still are happy to listen to it, but it's still super, super sad. Yeah. And I don't know, it's like the, it's the, the, what, it's a really important song for me, I guess. Yeah, it's yeah, you've nailed it. Like the the uh, a euphoric melancholy. It's like it shouldn't work together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's nothing else that really quite sounds like that. I don't think it's really good. Cool. Um, and okay, so it's the last tune. It's the end of the night. The crowd are asking for one more. What do you play? Uh, so yeah, we put we we hesitated a bunch for that one. <laughs> But uh, in the end, we put a Jasper Street uh, Company mm -hmm. and with that song Praising His Name, which is um, a proper gospel house song. And the choir is perfect. Everything sounds so good. The chords are amazing. And, and we basically play it every time. Yeah, every time we play <laughs> like the, Could be the last one or one of those two. Yeah, yeah. we're de definitely going to play, play yeah. it at some point. Yeah, that one is <laughs> always like, uh, it puts everybody in the best mood possible. Mm -hmm. It's like so uplifting and so positive. We, one of our favorite yeah. songs ever, I guess. Yeah, it's got a lot of soul to it. It's, yeah. 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 Okay, and so one final question before this is all over. Um, we always ask our guests, uh, we are House Culture. This is the House Culture podcast. And you guys are now uh, an intrinsic part of House Culture, you know, of the whole scene, whether you're producing hit records, working with major artists or, you know, DJing all anywhere in the world coming soon. Um, you know, when you look back on what you've achieved so far, how, where do you think you fit into the culture of the scene and what what has it brought you in your life and your career? It's an interesting question. I feel like from the very first day we were starting to produce for other people, we always try to add that extra French house flavor to every production that we made. Mm -hmm. And it only came right when like we after making all those records for diploma and everything and learned so many stuff that we felt like oh that was the time for us that's the time mm -hmm. for us to add our little like 
stuff to it and twist it and make it our own. And what that brought to us is so many, so many good memories. Like we, we love producing songs in the studio. We love being around like people and artists that we love, but we have the most fun playing DJ sets together. And it's always like yeah. the, we never like, we, it never feels like a job basically every time we do it. And it's pretty cliche to say that, but being in the studio so much for the past years, every time we went to have some gigs, it always felt like, oh, that's <laughs> the fresh air. Yeah. Like, you can see the sun, you can see people having fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we, we got a, a big, the biggest respect for all this French house era. And we, we really want to do something that has that is related to it, but we really want to bring something on the table too, like make it, making it like a new type of, of sound. And yeah, I guess that's our main goal and, and enjoying and making people dance. And obviously this is, as Max said, well, we're like super happy that everybody is going to come out and everything is going to reopen because I guess the funniest part is, is right yeah in front of us so mm -hmm. it's cool to make songs but wait. like it's cooler to see people dance to it yeah, yeah that's the the part that we missed really <laughs> yeah i mean yeah that's a brilliant final thought to end on with a positive note that we're all going to be out there experiencing mm -hmm. that live music again soon so we hope to catch you out there wherever and whenever you might be thank you so much thanks so much. thank you man thanks for having us thank Have you a man. nice day Bye. Bye -bye. house culture wow 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 i love that one especially hearing about that first meeting with diplo believe me coming face to face with your heroes can sometimes be an intense experience i hope you enjoyed that chat as well i really felt like i was talking to two genuine superstars of the future i cannot wait to see what they achieve under their own name the brothers also submitted some stellar choices to our playlist, which you can find on Spotify by searching for House Culture Perfect Playlist. You heard us talk about the incredible Synthy remix of Blessing in This House, so I had to add that one as well. And it's fantastic that Daft Punk have finally arrived to the party. You heard us talk about it. If you've not seen that Spike Jones directed music video for Daft Punk, you need to go and check it out after you've subscribed to the playlist, obviously. And if you want to get a taste of what the boys can deliver on the dance floor, keep your ears open for upcoming release Best of Me and keep your eyes on our socials as we will be releasing an exclusive hour-long mix produced by the duo themselves. Honestly, it'll be the new soundtrack to the rest of your summer. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please remember to love, like, tweet and share as well as leave us a rating or a review on Apple. We love hearing from you and are always happy to share your kind words with the rest of our listeners. This time around, I'm giving a huge shout out to the person who goes by the name of Lulu London, who got in touch on Instagram to say that they thought our special Glastonbury episode with Malcolm Haynes was wicked. Well, Lou, I'm ecstatic you enjoyed it and I hope you're now getting stuck into all of our previous episodes. And if you want to join our party at House Culture, please hit up our Instagram feed at housecultureNet or follow the hashtag TrueHouseCulture. It's a massive community that will not only keep you up to date with news on the podcast, but also connect you with other beat lovers from across the world. And finally, if you want to get in touch with me, Matt Rouse, you can do it directly on Instagram at DJ Matt Rouse. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and see you next time. House Culture.